Um, hi, um, my name is Seth McKenzie. Um, I come here to London by around a month ago. Um, I work on edge content optimization and Cloudflare, um, so measuring website performance and stuff like that. So I'm going to be talking about a thing I made uh, called Babel. Um, Woo! Yeah. <laughs> um, I just got a show of hands with who uses it. Awesome. Um, so, what is Babel? Um, so, it's an ES6 compiler, JSX optimizing compiler, um, general JavaScript transformation tool. Um, and it takes a lot of inspiration from current tools such as uh, Tracer by Google, um, CoffeeScript, and Google's Collision Compiler. Um, it kind of combines a lot of things from the model um, as sort of giving credits instead of being kind of like inspiration and have guided a lot of the work that I've done. Um, so what is JavaScript transformation? Um, so you put JavaScript in, uh, you get JavaScript out. Um, it's, it's fairly simple. Um, you may be familiar with um, some existing JavaScript transformers. You may not kind of group these in the same class of utility, like module bundles and minifiers at the core, kind of the same thing, JavaScript in, uh, JavaScript out. Um, and one of the things that kind of powers most of these tools is something called an AST, uh, stands for the abstract syntax tree. Um, and so it's it's a representation of the raw source code that you can then manipulate or analyze. Um, so for example, this piece of code is represented by this um, AST. It's a deeply nested um, of the, if each syntactic element is represented by a node that you can modify um, and have data about. Uh, a better way to visualize this is in a, a tree. Um, it is the T in AST. Uh, so if we've got a program with a variable declaration, it has a variable declarator with an identifier um, that that would be food in the previous example. Um, it has a function expression with a name, which is the identifier, then has a block statement with a single return statement. Um, and so this allows you to kind of yeah, introspect on each element. Um, you can manipulate this and then base and then generate this back again. So you traverse over this tree with a thing called traversal. Um, to have a visitor, uh, you visit that one, that, 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 uh, and then that. Then you do this over and over um, uh, to kind of, and then you transform it so you can, when you're visiting a node, you can replace it with other ones. So the visitor might be um, ES6 class specific, so it'll be visiting all class nodes and then replacing those with the equivalent set of nodes. Um, and so there's kind of three main parts to it. So you've got the parser, which passes the code, turns into that AST. The transformer then manipulates that and then passes off to the generator to generate it. Um, so I'll be focusing on the transformer since that's kind of where 90% of the work goes into. Um, it's kind of some, it's where most of Babel's internals and smarts are. Um, so Babel relies on a thing called path-based transformation. Um, so basically, so three, I want to show three concepts. So you've got the visitor, which that's what actually visits each node, and then there's the parent, which is the container for the node, and the child, which is the sub-node of the, the parent. Um, and so this is kind of what would happen. So contextless visiting is where you just you're just visiting the child. You only know about the child and the parent. You kind of don't know its relationship with the parent. Um, and this introduces some issues where, for example, if you're visiting the child node and then another node is added, um, the visitor has it, it, it loses its position. Um, this is kind of equivalent. So if you're looping over an array and then you push that array kind of messes up the indexes. You may not visit certain nodes because you might have inserted them earlier than what you're currently traversing over. Um, and Babel introduces this concept of a path where a path represents a node's location in the AST. It's unique and it allows you to easily introspect over the nodes and identify exactly where they are in the relationship to everything around them. Um, so if you just have an identifier and you don't know 
what that actually represents. You can't even apparent know. So for example, if you just have the function expression, I mean, that's fine, you know it's associated with the function expression, but what's its actual relationship? It could be a parameter, it could be the ID of the function. So you then have a path um, which knows, hey, this I represent an identifier that's the ID of the function. So you have contextual information. Um, and then you do this all the way back up the tree. So you have ancestry, so you can walk upwards, you can visit siblings, so you, you know exactly where its place is in it. Um, so we've got a path, it represents a branch relationship, so its relationship to the parent and everything around it. Um, and then there's the actual queue, which is responsible for maintaining all the paths that you then iterate over. So this is what stops it from um, losing track of itself. So this is kind of what Babel's equivalent looks like. So, uh, so if a node appears, the queue identifies it as a new node, um, and it kind of hooks it back up. Um, and so it, so the advantages of having a path is that it's basically an abstraction around a, uh, an element in the tree, so if, like each syntactic element of your code. Um, so if another part of the tree updates, um, it propagates up and all its siblings, the children, um, will update. So it's reactive to these tree changes and you can store stuff like metadata on the actual path instead of setting it on the node. Um, so why is this in, why is this useful or important? Um, so there's this bit of code, you want to explode it. Um, this is array restructuring, so it will be setting the first element of calculate coordinates uh, to x and then the second to y. Um, this will transform into something like this. But what if you have it in an expression position like this, which is perfectly valid? Um, in traditional kind of tools, you'll get something like this. Oh, that's best to be read. Um, so that's not valid. You're, ex you're replacing an expression with a statement or a list of statements. Um, and that's just not going to work. So your actual visitors or your transformers have to be aware of contextually what, they're, what the node actually represents, um, which is kind of bad because it becomes tedious and very verbose to write these kinds of things. Um, so Babel is aware that, hey, you're replacing an expression with a list of statements, and it knows how to explode those to retain the exact same semantics and meaning of the code um, so it doesn't break. Um, yeah, and so, that's, from, that's replacement, but what about removal? So let's say you want to remove the right node, um, you remove it, just then you suddenly have that. Um, you have a binary expression that just left. There's no right, so that's obviously going to break. Um, that one knows how you're removing um, the, the right one and just removes it and just leaves the left one in its place. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can do with this kind of JavaScript translation in general is a ton of them, there's a bunch more. So basically anything that deals with JavaScript, um, you can do kind of all this stuff with. Um, you can try this yourself by writing a Babel plugin. It gives you access to these uh, very simple APIs so they can do kind of complex transformations on your code. Um, uh, that's a kind of a new feature, so there's not quite many out there, but uh, yeah. And so this allows, so with these paths, you have all this metadata information, contextual information about the actual source code, which allows you to do very specific optimizations. So um, in React 0.14, uh, React elements can be treated as constant type, value types. So that means basically it looks the same, you know, kind of is the same. Um, so this contains no immutable data. So each time you call render, it's going to be creating that element. Uh, but we can hoist this so it creates only one instance of the element and re returns it each time. This is far better for performance um, since it's not constructing them each time. Um, you can do this for uh, I bindings as well, so references. So it's referencing through, which is required, and then text, um, which is the parameter of the create component. Um, it can then it to the highest scope, so it determines, hey, you're referencing text, I can't go any higher than this function, um, and then just inlines it, so the function that you've returned returns true um, every time. So this is kind of a simplistic way of kind of how it does that. It checks if the JSX element is 
the middle, um, it collects all the reference bindings inside, then it crawls the scope chain up, so this is where the paths come in handy, so you can check the ancestry. Um, then it walks up those, determines the highest one it can go to, and then it appends a declaration and then returns a reference in its place. Um, another thing is inlining JSX elements. Um, this is basically the representation that React does when you do React up and create element. Um, this should only really be done in production since React.createElement also throws those nice warnings that you see. Um, so this basically you will miss a lot of debug messages if you have this on uh, in development, but in production it can make a difference. You shouldn't have that method call on this one doing as much, it's doing it ahead of time. Um, that also includes a bunch of experimental syntax that while not React specific can aid in the development of React applications. Uh, really well. So there's class properties. So in ES6 classes, you can't have properties on class, um, which is kind of a hassle. But in there's a current proposal um, to add class properties, and that will influence it. It's currently behind a flag um, since only stable syntax is on my default. So here you're just defining an instance variable state, and then you've got default props and prop types um, as static properties. Um, there's also decorators. Um, this is kind of a way to work with property descriptors. So you can't, with the class syntax, you can't wrap, get full name. So if you wanted to modify that, you would then have to go, you'd have to look up the prototype, get the descriptor, manually mess with it and wrap it. Um, and the, the, the decorators are a way to kind of wrap these and work directly with the descriptor. So you could have a descriptor that makes the subsequent method non enumerable for example, or um, you can mark it as deprecated or kind of stuff like that. So in this instance, that autobind decorator would reference a function that was declared, um, and that would set, get full name to autobind, so we never can reference it, it would automatically bind, so you wouldn't have to do .bind this. Um, which leads to bind syntax, um, which is also a current proposal where um, you'll note in onclick, there's uh, two columns dependent, um, this automatically binds this dot tick to this. Um, with this proposal, there's also virtual methods, which I include in this example, um, that kind of allow you to do very powerful things that you will kind of commonly do when developing React applications. Um, so, one of Babel's strong points is tooling. Um, there's integrations for a lot of stuff. Um, so ESLint, there's a plugin that lets tell the ESLint to use Babel's parser, which means that all your Babel syntax that you write can be easily minted. So you don't have to worry about your linter being constantly in sync um, with language or and stuff like that. So there's a whole bunch of them that you're bound to have an integration for your tool. Um, and yeah, so another kind of thing that happened recently, a week and a half ago, is that. Uh, React core switched to building itself with Babel. Um, so Facebook kind of slowly deprecating their tooling um, in favor of Babel, um, it's pretty cool. Um, and so this kind of means that JS transforming React tools aren't going to be as, they're not really going to be maintained. Um, so that means you kind of have to migrate, which is just me. Um, uh, so migrating, um, there's kind of a blog post that shows how to migrate. So for example, if you're using Reactify with Browserify, it just says, oh, change Reactify to Babelify. Um, it contains very specific examples. Or if that's not listed there, there's also a kind of uh, setup wizard. So you just choose your tool, it'll show you how to install it um, and set it up. Um, yeah, so thanks. Um, following on Twitter, there's the links to docs and stuff. Yeah, thanks.